afternoon, everyone. Can you all hear me? How you all doing? All right, all right. What a crowd. It is so wonderful to be here in Stockholm. This is my first visit. Beautiful city. I wish I could spend more time here. This is just an amazing conference, and it's a real pleasure, privilege, and an honor to be up here talking to all of you. Uh, I'm, going to be talking about, I'm going to be talking about full stack type safety in JavaScript. And thanks to the excellent introduction from Godfrey, I don't have to cover the basics anymore. You all know what TypeScript is and why you should use it. But I want to take it one step further. What if you applied it to the entire stack? What if you had type safety across the front end, through the back end? What kind of development experience does that enable? And I wanted to show you in code. So it's going to be light on slides, heavy on code. Uh, first, a bit of introduction. Actually, the MCs did an excellent job, but uh, I'm a technical evangelist at AWS. I've been here for about a year. I helped AWS join the GraphQL Foundation, which is very exciting news. Earlier this year, we announced that GraphQL as a language is now being governed by the GraphQL Foundation, which is part of the Linux Foundation, and it's modeled after TC39. So you can guarantee that if you're a GraphQL user, well into the future, the evolution of the language will be governed by a neutral third-party group. Uh, I also used to work on the GraphQL team at Facebook, and then prior to that, it was at Microsoft. And just this year, uh, I became an, an author. This is my first book. Thank you, Kindle Self Publishing, the wonders of the internet. All right, so this is the question I had What's the ideal development experience? for breaking API changes. Not that you should always break your APIs, mind you. You should not do that. And what I mean by API breaking changes is, let's say you have a client, a web client. It's going to make some API calls to your server. It's going to fetch some data from the server. How does it do that? There's a protocol involved, right? You have to structure the request in a certain way. And then the client expects the data to come back in a certain format. What happens when either leg of that protocol is broken? Do you see an error in the console? Does it throw an exception? Is the error message helpful? Those are the kinds of things I mean when I ask this question. So the code we're about to look at, it's got a couple things going on. I just want to break it down real quick. That way, when you see the code, you have a sense of what you're looking at. On the back end, we have a GraphQL server. Not surprising. By the way, how many here have heard of GraphQL? OK, that's, that's most people. Actually, let me ask the other way around. How many people have never heard of GraphQL? OK, a couple people. All right, I, th I think this is going to work. <laughs> uh, so our GraphQL server is built with Apollo server and type GraphQL. Now, I think of these two, if you've worked with GraphQL, you've probably heard of Apollo server, type GraphQL, fairly new project. Don't worry, it's going to make a lot of sense as soon as I show you. That's the back end. And on the front end, I have React paired with GraphQL code generator. And with React, I'm just using create React app. I'm specifying the dash taps. TypeScript argument so that I get TypeScript bindings for my entire project. And then I have GraphQL Code Generator, which is a project that allows me to pull down the GraphQL schema into the React project. And it also compiles my .GraphQL files into TypeScript types. OK? Let's check out the code. Oh, OK, before I show you the code, I have to warn you that this demo is uh, very creative. Um, I don't think anybody's seen anything like this before. so. Prepare to be blown away. Uh, OK, this is, this is the API. I'll show you that in a second. But uh, for the demo, I, I created this <laughs> to-do list manager to manage your to-dos. Um, I'm sure none of you have ever tried anything like this. So let me show you how it works. I can add a new list here, like uh, speak at Nordic.js, and then I can add an item here, like And then I can click one of these when I'm done, and then I can click Clear Done, and then it disappears. Right? I know. I know. Isn't that incredible? Can't believe nobody's thought of this before. OK, so let's think about this, though. What happened here? From an API call perspective, 
there were actually a couple things that happened. When the app first loaded, we had to fetch all of the lists, right? And that should be persisted on the server. So we had to fetch all the lists. And then I was able to add a new list. I was also able to add an item to a list. I was able to mark the item as completed. And then I was able to remove the completed items from an existing list. Right? Pretty simple. So let's take a look at how the API, the GraphQL API I have here, provides all of this functionality. So what you're looking at here is GraphQL Playground. GraphQL Playground is one of the GraphQL IDEs that allows you to explore your GraphQL endpoint. It's really simple. You have these two panels. On the left, you author your GraphQL document that gets sent over as part of your request. And on the right, if the request executes successfully, it's going to return the data corresponding to your request. All that's left to do is to figure out what exactly is a syntactically valid request in this case. And to figure that out, we have to inspect the schema, which we can get from clicking on this schema tab. And so this is the entire schema. You can see it's not very long. I want to draw your attention to two particular operations here. This type down here, the query. Now, there are three GraphQL operations, query, mutation, and subscription. Forget about subscriptions just for a moment. A query models a read, and mutation models a write. So here, we can see that this API is telling us, as a read operation, I can fetch all lists. Makes sense, right? And then for the mutations, these are the operations that I can use to affect the server state. I can add a list. I can add an item. I can mark an item as done, and I can clear done items. This corresponds one-to-one -one with the functionality that we just saw in the front end, except that it's called out very clearly in this schema. Now, another thing about the schema, you remember how Godfrey just showed you how TypeScript has these uh, colon return type? This should look kind of familiar, right? So what the query type says is, if you try to query for the field called all lists, you are going to get an array designated by these square brackets. You're going to get an array of to-do list exclamation. What does the exclamation mean? It means that the to-do list is non-nullable. So you never have to worry about it being null when you have an instance of to-do list. It doesn't mean that the list will always be populated with some number of to-do lists. It just means that when it comes back, you won't have um, for example, null, some list, null, null, and then some other list. That's all this is saying. OK? So knowing that, I can come in here and start writing a query. I can say query, curly brackets, all lists. And here's the thing with GraphQL. Your GraphQL query must terminate in what are called scalar fields. Scalar fields, you can think of them as similar to primitive types, like numbers, ints, IDs, bools. That's what your query has to terminate in. And the thing is, to-do list is not a scalar field. So I can't just run this query right here. I have to go further. I have to pick fields out of to-do list. So what are the fields that are valid for to-do list? I can confer to the schema. And right down here, I see that the type def definition for to-do list has ID, name, and items, which is telling me that each to-do list has the ID field, the name field, and a collection of items. So knowing that, I can come in here and I can say, if I choose only ID and name, these are scalar fields. That makes this a valid GraphQL query. And I can execute this, and I can see that I'm getting back the data that I added through the UI earlier. And notice that the data that comes back is JSON. And it is structurally very similar to the GraphQL query that we wrote on the left. In fact, this child property of data, it resembles this thing very closely. And that's not an accident. It's as though GraphQL, the GraphQL document, is the JSON document, but slightly reverse engineered, where the reverse engineering process is we just stripped away the value half of the document,
and we remove the double, the, the double quotes, leaving only the key pairs. So what if I want items? Well, items is not a scalar field. But I can see over here that to do items has these properties. So if I come in here and say something like ID, I now get all of the items. And the way to read this query in plain English is, I want to fetch all the lists. For each list, I want to fetch the ID, name, and items. And for each item of each list, I want to fetch the ID, name, and description. OK? So hopefully that's a good refresher for what GraphQL is, because it's going to start mattering when we try to generate TypeScript bindings for this API. Now, over in the code, back on the client, we actually run a very similar operation to what we just wrote in the GraphQL Playground. In fact, GraphQL Playground, usually the, my development workflow is I write the query in here, I test it out, I get the data that I think I need, and then I copy and paste this whole thing, and I just move it into a .graphql file that's part of my front-end project. And the file for that is in here in get all lists. And it looks a little bit different. It's got a couple of these things called fragments. And a fragment is just a piece of GraphQL text that you can reuse over and over. And the one that we're particularly concerned with is this full list details fragment. And that, you can see, is part of this get all lists, which includes our all lists root field. So I said earlier that now that we have this information and we have the GraphQL file on the client, we can pair that with the schema in order to generate these types. So where is the schema? Let me show you that real quick. It's in this graphql.schema.json file. And this looks a lot more complicated than the schema that we saw earlier. And that's because the long form JSON representation of the schema is more complicated. It is more complicated than the schema description language that you saw in the browser over here. But this, this schema right here, this is all that JSON document is expressing. Now, you can argue about whether it could have been more verbose or, or more, ter more terse, but this is the representation. So at this point, now that the client has these two pieces of information, the graphql.schema.json and the GraphQL file here, we, as human beings, we kind of have everything we need, right? We can go through this thing, and we can write our own TypeScript bindings for the data that's being returned from the server. And if you believe anything Godfrey said, then that's quite valuable, because it can help you prevent a lot of bugs. It can point you in the right direction when you're trying to fix any issues in your code. So let me show you what that looks like when you have everything integrated together. Um, so the first thing I want to show you is, let's add a new item. Oh, actually, before I go on, let me show you what actually gets generated. So with GraphQL Code Generator, GraphQL Code Generator does all this automatically. What I just said about combining the .graphql file with the schema and generating the TypeScript types, GraphQL Code Generator does that for you out of the box. Uh, there are other tools that do that as well, but I, I chose this one because I think it does it in a way that is very customizable. And you can see that what it's actually generated here is this type right here for the full list details fragment. First off, it's, it's saying, well, get all lists query is right here. And it has a field called all lists. And this is TypeScript right here, right? This is TypeScript. And it's saying that all lists is of type array with a generic argument in it. It's an array of what? It's an array of, and this is, um, this is basically just TypeScript annotation for saying that it has a property called type name that is a value to-do list, but it's also anded with uh, all the properties on this type, which is defined down here. So this is all generated. You can take a closer look at this later. I'll, I'll put up the URL for the, for the project shortly. Um, but hopefully you trust me at this point that this is, this is a generated file when I run an NPM command. And then npm command just kind of scoops up the .graphql file and the schema, and it generates for this for me automatically. The next question is only, like, where do we use this stuff? Right? So let me show you that as well. 
Let's say that we have add new item. Okay. So this is what happens. This function right here is what gets called when in the UI I click add new item. This is the browser prompt for the, the new item, right? Uh, this is this right here. So as soon as I get a name back from this prompt, I try to put it into the, the input argument. I try to call add new item, specifying the name as part of the input variable. So the first thing that GraphQL in conjunction with GraphQL code generator has done for me is this th entire thing is typed. So if you look at this, it says the input variable is of type add new item mutation variables. That's a mouthful, but it's actually quite descriptive. It's saying that this is a mutation operation. The mutation operation takes a single input variable, and the single input variable is of this type, and we can navigate to that type, and we can look at what it takes. Right? So I can see right down here, without going through graphical, uh, sorry, uh, the browser uh, GraphQL Playground, I can just use navigate through the generated types, and I can find exactly the structure for the input that I need in order to add a new item. So what this means is that if I come in here and I specify something that doesn't actually exist, TypeScript will tell me that this is now no longer a valid request. And this is actually quite profound because it means that TypeScript, well, the entire project setup, that is, it's preventing me from issuing an invalid request that the server would just reject. And it's doing this before I ever have to issue the request. Right? So in other words, it's shortening my development test feedback loop, which is extremely valuable because that's what we do over and over and over again every day. So great, this has already told me that it's not going to work if I try to specify this argument. Right? Now what happens if I introduce an API breaking change? So right now, this add item operation takes a new item input. Takes an, this is where the, um, the generated code comes from. It comes from this mutation, and it says it takes a single input argument of type new item input exclamation, which means you cannot null this out and simply pass in null. Well, what's new item input? It's right down here. It takes three parameters, list ID, name, and description. So far, so good. So what if I add another required input variable to this? Well, that would break the API, right? Because the client is no longer providing all three input variables or all four input variables. So let's really quickly, let's um, make the code change on the GraphQL side so that we require one more input variable. OK? And bear with me, this is going to be a lot of code, so um, you need to follow along quickly. All right, we're done. Um, so <laughs> if I refresh this, I now see a priority field that's part of the new item input. And it is of type float. Now, interesting thing here, it's of type float. I didn't say it was float. I said it was of type number. This is a TypeScript annotation right here, right? So type GraphQL actually went and said, OK, well, you said it was a TypeScript type number. But I'm going to convert that to the GraphQL type float. And that's a decision that type GraphQL made. Some, there might be some edge cases where that's incorrect, but that's what's happened here. Uh, and, and just so you're wondering, you can provide arguments in here to customize this. Um, so you can override the type that it, that it um, converts it into. For example, you can say that it's an int, and it will use the GraphQL int type. Right? Another cool thing you can do here is you can say this is nullable is true. And if I did this, then notice that the priority field here is, doesn't have an exclamation mark at the end of the float which means that I don't need to provide it when I pass in an input item, a new item input 
object, an input, input variable. And this is actually really, really valuable because as we have it now, this is not an API breaking change. Actually, I'll prove it to you. Well, maybe it'll blow up and then it'll be very fun. <laughs> OK, it seemed to work. Any errors in the console? No? OK, so far so good. Um, but if I turn this thing, if I just leave this nullable equals false, you must provide it. OK, now it's required. Now, if I come in here and I say new item, all right, how many people think this is going to work? Show of hands, how many people think it's going to work? Yeah, a couple people over there, yes. All right, let's try it. OK, no new item. Uh, that is because, OK, so we see this, uh, this uncaught um, exception over here. Right above it, we actually have a GraphQL message that said variable input got invalid value. What about this, blah, blah, blah. Field value.priority of required type float was not provided. That's pretty helpful. But nothing in my TypeScript uh, React application told me that I needed something of type priority, right? And that's because we didn't sync the schema. The client thinks it's working with an outdated schema. That's the problem. Let's fix that. Oh, whoops, that's, I stopped the wrong project. Okay. And when it did this, now if I come into here to generate it, um, you can see that new to my input has been updated to include the presence of this priority field. Right? Now, look at this. One problem in this file. Hmm, what could it be? OK, priority is declared here. Priority is missing, but required. So if I come in here and just say priority, we'll hard code something here. Now the compiler warning goes away. And all of that was TypeScript, by the way. That's just TypeScript uh, running as part of VS Code. And if I start the application again, I hope I don't get the bubbles. <laughs> that has got to be the most creative way to shoo someone off the stage, you know? I feel like they got to do that, and they got to do the whole cartoon hook thing where they... <laughs> All right. OK, is this going to work? Show of hands, how many people think it's going to work? How many people don't think it's going to work? <laughs> Nobody. OK. All right, it worked. And no errors in the console. And not only that, um, if I come in here, and um, I've, been, I've been using this really, really fancy database for this project. Um, it's called state.json. And uh, you can see right here, it's actually persisted that, that to do to this state.json file. So there's no smoke or mirrors here. I know that, that maybe you're like, well, that's, that's so simple. Why would there need to be anything? But um, there you have it. There, that's the development experience that I think is, is pretty good. You know, there's only one extra manual step in there, which is periodically you need to run uh, npm run code gen to synchronize the schema between your client and your server. Lots of optimizations you can do there. But I think this is pretty good. I think this is just about as good as full stack JavaScript development has been um, since I've been doing web development. And uh, now we can really combine these tools in a way that gives us this rapid feedback when we're developing code. It tells us, hey, no, don't do that. That's not going to work. Don't ship that code. Um, 
or when it does break in a certain way, look, here's what you gotta do to fix it. It's right here on this line in your IDE, click go to definition, right? This is some really nice stuff and I, and I think it really, you know, ups the game in terms of making this entire thing a pleasure to work with. So that's what I wanted to show you. Thank you very much for listening. And yes, I got the bubbles, awesome.